Out-of-hospital cardiac arrest affects approximately 60 people every year in the city of Richland. Because of this, it becomes one of our greatest opportunities to not only save a life, but to enhance the quality of life for those patients and their families. You see, every time our men and women are dispatched to a cardiac arrest, they find themselves in a race against the clock to not only restore a heartbeat, but to preserve neurological function so that these patients can return home to their loved ones with the same quality of life as they did before. Fortunately, we have some of the best emergency services personnel in the nation. However, when we look to increase neurologically intact survival from cardiac arrest, it truly takes a village. And this is where a whole community approach begins. In 2018, we established Heart Safe Richland, a public education initiative to increase neurological survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. The foundation of this initiative is supported by nationwide research, industry best practices, and innovative solutions. As a leader for this initiative, I invite you to follow us during National CPR and AD Week, June 1st through the 7th, to learn more about Heart Safe Richland and the opportunities that you have to partner with us to save a life. Today, we are out in North Richland at Central Industrial Sales and Supply with Jay. Jay, I'm here to talk to you just about the heart safe training you guys experienced back in February. Kind of tell everybody listening today just how you found Heart Safe Richland and what led you to hosting a training for your entire staff. Well, how we found about it was just through a connection of a friend to a friend kind of thing, right. um, and how it led into getting a hold of you guys. And I just knew that it, it's important, um, you know, for every business to to have that type of training because you know we have a I think an annual basis of like 300,000 people die of sudden cardi cardiac arrest a year. And so it doesn't mean, you know, just because you're healthy, you're gonna be okay every day, you know? So it could be anything from nobody knows, right? right. And so, you know, I just wanna be on train and, and on par and, and just make sure our staff's aware of if someone does drop a customer or even a you know, employee of some, some sort, you know, and that we know what to do and how to handle it and how to take care of them and get the, right steps going in order for, in preparation for when you guys come to kind of take care of the rest. Absolutely, yeah, and you, you make a great point, right? I mean, throughout the U.S., throughout the nation, there's over 300,000. Mm -hmm. uh, in the city of Richmond, consistently, we have around 60 to 70 um, out of hospital cardiac arrests every year. And although the majority of those happen in a home setting, you are actually pretty vulnerable out here in, in North Richland. And we kind of chatted about that and we'll, we'll, we'll just jump right to that question. So you trained 100% of your staff mm -hmm. and then through that training and through kind of some of the, the various videos and the conversations we had, I think it became pretty apparent as to how vulnerable you are out here with the train crossing. Absolutely. And if that train just happens to be passing through while somebody has a cardiac arrest, not just in this business, but in this business area, uh, you don't have any AD available. And we really highlighted the importance of getting that AED on the chest within four minutes. And I think that probably drove you guys to saying, you know what, we want to be prepared not Absolutely. only for our people, yeah. but for those around us if something happens. Absolutely. You, you think about your relatives and your family and loved ones too. You know, every second matters. You know, just the, 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 the questioning of what to do next, you know, that, that one second can matter from a life to a death. Absolutely. And that, you know, especially with your loved ones and people around you. You know, you guys experience it more than what we do because in our line of work, we're not saving lives. You know, we're, we're saving people from making mistakes, you know, but those seconds are important. So in preparation, if you can be fully prepared with your staff and just you as an individual, you're going to make a big difference in your community. Absolutely. Well, and you know, I think when you look at a business, the way we look at them is, is one, the heart safe training allows us to develop a relationship with you and, and kind of put faces to names and, and business names. But the way I look at it is you're providing a service to the community. Oh, absolutely. This is a different service than what we provide. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when somebody's in need, you want to be able to serve them maybe outside of your normal business day-to-day -day ventures, right? Yeah. And so when we go out here and, and you know, you guys bring us in to provide this training to build a relationship and then maybe even equip you with tools like the AD to serve those citizens in need. I think that just really goes to tell the complete story of what this community is all about, which is just serving one another, right? Um, so how is a heart safe training different from maybe previous CPR AD training you've received? I think it was more of just uh, the basically more hands-on. You know, not that, you know, normal C, you know, CPR training wasn't hands-on. You know, it was a very relaxed type. Um, s surrounding, you know, not you're with, you know, the people that you're with every day, 
yeah. you know and so like you're feeling like you know it's part of that community and going through that step by step and then taking I think we were with you like two to three hours you know that morning and so you know getting that full training was totally worth it you know and being no you know from start to finish and not just knowing the beginning but to the end to the point when the paramedics arrive what to do how to handle that and where to go from there right and you know when I reflect back on that training with your staff I was probably here for a couple of hours but a lot of that I think was in the setup and the takedown of just kind of having that sidebar conversation, which yep. is really what, if there's an opportunity, what we're all about is just trying to, to, like I said, put faces to names and get to know each other. Uh, the training itself was probably 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, so lastly, we'll sum it up with this. What would you say to other businesses out there? You know, Heart Safe Richland, we're trying to train a minimum of 15% of our community on an annual basis, which is quite a task. Right. Um, and what we want to do is create more Heart Safe campuses out there. And uh, I guess from a business partner in the community, what would you say to other businesses that haven't hosted a training yet? It's super important to do. You know, you think about, yeah, it's a hindrance to your, you know, your, your daily work, you know, it's gonna hold us back from being able to get a performance of what we need to accomplish that particular day. But the importance in the long run, if, if an incident does take place, um, just recently I had an incident similar to that, not quite to the AED scenario, but the training kicked in and our staff has been fully trained. You know, this is a side note, kind of outside of, of work that kicked in and we actually, everything went really well. And, and the patient is good. I mean, uh, the guy ended up just having a seizure, but we handled it correctly in this right, correct steps. But I think it's important just um, so that everybody's on the same page. Um, you know, it's easy. It's not really much of a, there's no risk. There's not, it's not a big task. It's you know, you think about it, you make things bigger than they really need to be. And I think be, by coming in and you, Josh, kind of presenting everything and laying it all out, you know, doing the video and doing the hands-on was like, dude, this is like great. Like we should have done this years ago. And I just think it's important now because if maybe our neighbors over here across the street or something happens with maybe one of their employees and they're not ready, at least, you know, we have an AD and we're ready to come over and assist and help and maybe save that person's life because at the end of the day you can't bring dead people back to life once they're gone and I think that life is very very delicate and I think sometimes we take that for granted each and every day and so if we can be in the right manner and right steps and preparation for that to help our community and be stronger as businesses man all the power I say do it yeah absolutely well Jay, it was a pleasure interviewing Absolutely. you today. It was more of a pleasure to provide the training. Absolutely. And uh, when your AED gets here on campus, we look forward to helping you uh, make sure you guys are prepared to use the AED yeah. and make sure that you have that in the proper location. Before we get going though, yeah. I want to provide you with a certificate of uh, recognition for, uh, All right. well, thank for the you. training and I for allowing it. us to come out and partner yeah. with you. Yeah, thank and, you. And uh, serve our community well. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, we look forward to you coming out and doing the training and we're just excited to be able to help the community to save a life. Awesome, so, thanks Jay. Thank you. Dr. Hodges, thanks for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, good to be here. Yeah, so um, as we discussed uh, prior to this interview beginning, June 1st through the 7th is National CPR and AED Week. And back in 2018, uh -huh. uh, the city of Richland really started to pursue what we've now branded as Heart Safe Richland. Uh, and part of that was because we saw the need to really improve neurologically intact survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. And when we looked at heart safe communities through the Citizen CPR Foundation, uh, their 13 criteria really provided us a solid track that was holistic in nature, right? Um, you know, you've been our, our medical program director since 2008. And, you know, one thing that I know you know, we've seen that you may have also seen is that in cardiac arrest specifically, but really in a lot of the things that we see EMS in nature, it's not just how well the EMS service is, it's how well the community responds to that emergency. And that's been one of the things that's really intrigued us to pursue heart safe communities. So from your perspective as the medical program director, how important is it to really embrace heart safe communities and a holistic perspective when it comes to you know trying to produce neurologically intact survivors from cardiac arrest. 
Yeah, the answer to that is that it's, it's incredibly important. It depends on your goal, and but it's the whole chain of survival, right? There's there's something that has to happen immediately at the cardiac arrest level or event or before, and then what happens? You can't put a paramedic, you know, in every house. You can't put a paramedic on every corner, uh, and so you have to have a community engagement. There's a certain amount. There's a limit to what we can do by improving EMS. And improving the EMS response, of course, is a part of it, just like improving the, uh, the hospital response or the emergency department response. But that extends forward uh, before that. And it has to be a community involvement, especially for something like a witnessed cardiac arrest, where a community witnessed arrest and a community person getting immediately involved in doing chest compressions has probably the greatest chance of, of increased success on, on that outcome than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then you take it farther back in the community involvement for good heart health and for good cardiology and for good primary care and the health service uh, in general. Uh, but all of those are essential to improve outcomes. The limits of what we can achieve just by making EMS wonderful is, uh, is inadequate. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we've noticed through um, triaging the tapes through CECOM, you know, listening to some of the, the call takers' recordings, it, it seems as though there was a huge recognition barrier and then there's that emotional barrier too. You know, in Richland, I know the last few years, around 70%, which is on par with what the nation experiences as well, you know, 70% of our cardiac arrests are happening in the home. And so it's that wife or that husband witnessing somebody they, they truly love and care for go into seizure-like activity, gasping respirations. And that's been one thing that we've really had to educate the community on it. And here's, here's what you can expect, right? Because when they don't expect it, it's super difficult for them to overcome that. But um, yeah, that's been one of the things that we've really truly enjoyed. And, and part of that process is when we go out and teach these classes or when we go and build relationships across the street at Cadillac, or um, you know, we find community partners, whether it be the Kiwanis, the, 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 the Rotary, other civic organizations, you know, part of heart safe communities is really all about building relationships, you know, creating shared visions amongst leadership teams to say, hey, this is how the community truly makes a difference. You know, when we reflect upon relationships in general, especially around cardiac arrest, you know, how important is it from your perspective to have really healthy relationships across that chain of survival? in order to really truly be able to work well together and have a beneficial outcome. You know, it's that relationship that is that interplay between each component, be each chain in that, you know, or each link in that chain. Uh, and if there one is missing, then, then that's a big deal. And they have to have some trust uh, on both sides uh, of the link. So if the EMS link, you know, both sides of that are the, the community on one side and the hospital on the other. And if there's a failure on either side, the whole chain and the whole system breaks down. So I have to be able to trust in the emergency department that my EMS providers are going to bring me, have done everything that they need to do and bring me the, the situation, bring me the patient uh, with the interventions that needed to happen already happen. And then I need to be able to trust that my cardiac intensive care unit and my cardiologists and my intensive care uh, specialists are going to be able to take that ball from me as well and take that patient from me and, and do what needs to happen for the aftercare following the resuscitation. In the same way that the EMS providers are hamstrung if they don't have the trust and they don't have the ability to have faith in the in the citizens to recognize a cardiac arrest and to immediately take action. And that bar is so low that you reaching out to the community and giving them uh, information on that and showing that there's not a lot that you have to do. It's, it's just this and it's such a low level of commitment, but it makes such a positive and a major impact. So it's that same kind of trust that you have on both sides, that we have on both sides and without that relationship and without that level of trust uh, it breaks down. Absolutely. You know, you know I've been with Richland now for eight years and as I mentioned Heart Safe Richland we kind of started to pursue that back in 2018 and I know you've had many discussions with our battalion chiefs with our leaders on kind of our hopes our, our wants our desires and improving our EMS system at Richland Fire and that's been one thing we've really appreciated to have a, a medical program director like yourself kind of in our corner, challenging what we want to do, but supporting us along the way to improve what we offer, right? What's been the, the motivator behind you supporting us in, in the way that you have? You know, 
in conversation, I think it, it, it might be pretty easy for a lot of medical pro program directors across the nation to kind of say, you know what, that's maybe a little bit too risky. Why don't we just keep our protocols the way they are and I'll let you know when I want you to change. Rather than really allowing us to come in with this passion that we have to say, hey doc, this is something we really want to pursue. Can we pursue this and will you support us? What has been that, um, that factor there that's, that's made you comfortable in supporting what we've wanted to do? Well, it's a, it's, a whole, it's a whole number of things that need to be in play to support that. Uh, for one, uh, the, it's the, the literature and the, and the research that's involved in cardiac arrest. And it's really only in the last 10 to 15 years that there's been enough objective and well-designed research to support significant changes in cardiac arrest management. And that goes along with what you see, which is significant changes in cardiac arrest survival rates, the improvement with that. Then you have to have a baseline of training and understanding. So when we get the, get the physicians to buy on, you get the fire departments to buy on, you get the ambulance companies to buy on. So the pre-hospital personnel are then uh, educated and trained. And, and to a large extent, that was initiated in our area uh, by the uh, uh, Resuscitation Academy in King County. Uh, taking that research and taking that uh, that data and putting it out to the people and making changes in a way that was faster and more effective than anything we'd seen in the past. And we bought onto that pretty early. It was back in 2013, I think, that, yeah. that we really made some of those initial changes and we started looking and saying, what are our current numbers? Because before that we hadn't paid attention, you know, it seemed like, oh, we got somebody back, man, that's fantastic. And, and how do we go from that to the expectation? that we're not just gonna get somebody back from cardiac arrest, but they're gonna be walking out of the hospital and be able to talk to their family members and, and, and have meaningful, uh, meaningful lives following a cardiac arrest. And, then, uh, and so we started that program on a, on a larger scale basis in the state and especially here in Benton and Franklin counties. And then, there are, and then we got to the point where fortunately uh, we were able to now take it from this is somebody else's research and then to we want to be a part of that research. We want to be on the leading edge of cardiac arrest survivability and actual real cardiac arrest and resuscitation data and research. And as a big part of that, Richland Fire has been extremely proactive in that. There's uh, support from the top down and from the bottom up on both sides. Everybody at Richland Fire has been very excited about it and very interested and invested in taking that, being a part of it and making it actually happen. And so it's really that level of commitment from the fire department, both at the administrative level and at the line level, that has allowed us in Benton and Franklin County to not just take the research from the Resuscitation Academy and apply it to our, apply it to our population and our patients, but actually be a part of taking that data and making it better and improving the research and being a part of that research. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot there, right? I, I think that um, we've been influenced, like you said, by the Resuscitation Academy. And you know, we go to conferences all over the place and, and we come back with that energy, that excitement. And, and uh, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the, the stance we've taken as a county and as an agency. I, I love what you said there is, you know, our expectation is that we have neurologically intact survivors. Every cardiac arrest we get dispatched to, and that's, that's really fun to be a part of, you know, because I've been in the fire service now for just 20 plus years and, and it wasn't always that way. It was, it was very much so kind of like, well, a cardiac arrest is what we're responding to and it's highly unlikely that they're gonna survive. And now that's not acceptable, no matter the case, whether it was witness, unwitnessed, what have you, we expect to do really well for that patient and their family. Um, and that, I think that, that comes through just the motivation we've had from yourself, from our leaders and from uh, the, really the region in general. We have a really strong regional approach to EMS and cardiac arrest uh, survival. Um, you know, we, we get the opportunity to go out to different conferences throughout the, throughout the world, really. Uh, this year, we're gonna be over at the Advanced Cardiac Resuscitation Summit in June in Denver. We've got the Cardiac Arrest Survival Summit in San Diego in December as well. What would you say to other agencies who want to improve neurologically intact survival, but just don't really know where to start? What advice as a medical program director would you have to their systems, to their leaders, uh, to improve their systems? And those, to those people, I say they're, you're, you're in a good place because the outlines and the infrastructure and the plans have been drawn up 
And so you're not starting from scratch anymore. Ten years ago, we were all starting from scratch and trying to figure out everything as, 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 it, as it came along. And now we're a decade into this project, and we see a lot of what works and what doesn't work. And so we have that infrastructure in place. So I would encourage you to attend something like the Resuscitation Academy, attend some of the cardiac arrest uh, um, conferences, and talk to people, and you'll find out that it's an easier program, and it's a more detailed, it's a more organized program that's all set up for you. If you're interested in starting, we've got the, we've got the blueprints for you. And they yeah. joke sometimes that if you've seen one EMS agency, you've seen one EMS agency. Right. And that's a good comment that everybody's resources are a little bit different. We're not the same as Seattle proper, mm -hmm. you know, downtown Seattle. No, but the same as, you know, uh, we're not, we're not a, a, an extremely rural county either uh, or in a situation either. And so we have different resources, but those blueprints are there mm -hmm. and it can make a difference whether you are in an urban environment or whether you're in a deep rural environment. Yeah, because it still takes that whole community approach, right? Absolutely. Wherever we find ourselves, we still need the entire chain of survival. And only with the buy-in of the community is that possible. Absolutely. Yeah, great point. Well, lastly, what I'd like to really know is what are your thoughts on resuscitation for the future? What does that look like from your perspective? And um, how do you think we're going to achieve an increase in neurologically intact survival? So all the chain, all the links of those chains, of that chain has to be there uh, to improve. Uh, one of the advantages of the research that we've seen and the results that we're starting to see and have seen is that it shows us a little bit more about what's possible. If you look at historically, and I say before 2010 or so, that uh, your odds of success, uh, or I should say a positive neurologic outcome, meaning coming out without brain damage or significant disability following a cardiac arrest outside the hospital was somewhere around 3%, uh, which is 3% better than it was 50 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> but still uh, terrible. And now we're seeing numbers uh, that suggest that that number may be possible up to 70%, maybe higher. And so uh, seeing those numbers uh, gives us something to shoot for. I mean, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago that we'd be sitting on 50% out of hospital cardiac arrest, even in select situations uh, with positive neurologic outcomes, I would have politely laughed in their face. Uh, <laughs> but having seen, seen those results and now having seen what's, what, what next is possible, in the future what I'd like to see is better recognition. If we have better recognition at the community level, first off, of course, better uh, access to primary care and better access to heart health uh, uh, community measures. And then number two is better recognition. So that recognition, like you were mentioning before, that 70% mm -hmm. of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests are not initially recognized as, as cardiac arrests. And to somebody who's not trained in that, of course that's easy because it's not necessarily intuitive because it's not necessarily how it's seen on TV, you know, it can always clutch their chest and then fall over and that's it. No, it can mimic a seizure activity. It can look like difficulty breathing. It can be that they just fell unconscious and now they're breathing funny. And so increasing that education, increasing that level of recognition, and then increasing that community engagement where they're getting hands on the chest, uh, recognizing immediately, getting hands on the chest and bridging that time until a defibrillator and a professional rescuer can arrive. Uh, followed by that good follow-up of continuing to use evidence-based medicine by EMS agencies, EMS providers in the emergency department, and then we continue to improve uh, the in-the-hospital and then the rehabilitation side of things. So without all of those links improving, uh, uh, I, there's, no, there's no path forward. And, but with those links improving, um, it's going to be an exponential response. You know, I think that that really highlights the importance of heart safe communities, right? You know, we, we really focus on each chain in that link and, um, or each link in that chain. And um, I really appreciate having you here today. I really appreciate having you as our medical program director. We've seen a lot um, of improvements in our system throughout the years, and I'm really excited for the future. So um, thank you again for your time today. I'm here today with the family of Brie Barron, uh, a young cardiac arrest survivor. And we get to hear really the inspirational story behind her survival. And uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of good points today that we're able to take from this conversation to not just 
leave inspired, which I already came inspired because of what's going on in your family and, and, and her awesome personality and story, which I learned from you um, just a, a little bit on the phone. Uh, but we're going to be able to take the points that we, we talk about today and educate our community. You know, Heart Safe Richland was established in 2018, and uh, our whole goal is to achieve what we achieved in Brie. Right, neurologically in tax survival, where she's able to celebrate, you know, birthdays and Christmases with you, her family, and uh, I'm already getting, you know, chills down my spine just thinking about it, um, because really, you know, last year we had 14% neurologically in tax survival in, in the city of Richland, and our goal is to get 50% neurologically in tax survival, but we won't get there unless we educate the community and make them feel comfortable to act as though you did, Lynette, and so, um, you know, we're here in Howard Eamon Park today, where the event took place um, just almost three years ago in September this year. So if you wouldn't mind, Lynette, just kind of giving us a rundown of what you experienced and what you guys were doing at the park that day and, and really um, what took place is, as though what would be a, a fantastic result at the end of the day. Well, um, I was playing tennis with um, my sister-in-law and her daughter and we had the kids and my mom was there as well and she was kind of watching the kids off to the side and they had been playing over at the park in the play area and then they came over it was hot and so they sat down inside the tennis courts to have a drink of Gatorade so they were sitting there having their Gatorade and then um, Bree um, was sitting there and her cousins were sitting a little ways over and so um, she's just was sitting there and all of a sudden she kind of just fell over and I thought she was playing because my tennis bag was laying up against the fence and her head kind of went behind my tennis bag so I thought she was just ducking her behind my bag and playing I said Bree what are you doing because her cousins were there and anyway she didn't respond so then I went over to see and I saw that Bree was seizing and so I immediately went into emergency mode I guess and I told my sister-in-law to immediately call 911, call Rochelle, her mom. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I picked up Brie and took her out of the tennis courts because it was very hot that day. And and so I picked her up and brought her out and laid her down on the grass under the tree, and just so we were in the shade and um, tried to um, bring her conscious, wake her up, shake her. Brie, Brie, can you hear me? you know, and, and talk to her and she wasn't really responding. She was still breathing um, uh, um, shallow, I guess. Um, and by then we had 911 on the phone. My niece gave me the phone, so I had 911 um, in my ear. And she told me to um, start 911, to start CPR. Yeah. So we did. Yeah. And um, fortunately we, we're, super, we're right here at the park, and so the fire department was close by. They came really quickly. Um, I was doing CPR when they arrived. Um, Bree wasn't, before, be, well, <laughs> before I started CPR, she still, I could, I shook her and, and, and I say, breathe, breathe, breathe. And she would take a breath and it would be <sighs> just a, a rush breath, not, like a gasping Normal, a gasping, yeah, yes. Yeah. And and then I started the CPR, and yeah. the 911 operator was very helpful. Yeah. She was very helpful, and she just said, okay, we're going to count together, and she counted me through it, and the paramedics arrived very quickly. You know, so many good things come out of what you did, right? Obviously, Bree's alive today because <laughs> of what you did. Um, but, you know, a question I'll ask you is, did you... You know, you've had training before. You were a CNA. You've had multiple CPR and first aid classes, I'm sure. Uh, but did you ever expect the seizure-like activity in cardiac arrest? Or no. was that really uh, kind of out of left field? I was surprised that yeah. um, she seized, but I recognized it as a lack of oxygen, that she wasn't breathing. That's yeah. what caused the seizure to me. It was like uh, airway obstruction. So like the gasping respirations mm -hmm. with the seizure-like activity kind of three or four loop and, and I think you know oftentimes when we talk about you know recognition and cardiac arrest that's a huge barrier when we talk to our dispatchers and we listen to the tapes when they triage what's going on oftentimes that is what sets people back in wanting to help somebody 
I, and I shouldn't say wanting to help, but being able to engage because they think, well, they're not in cardiac arrest, right? There's something else going on. But uh, the <clears throat> ability for you to quickly, you know, kind of engage and give people roles and responsibilities because like we talked earlier people want to help they just need to know what to do and so by you saying hey you do this you do this and I'm going to act and then listening to the dispatcher and not hesitating to do that that primes that pump for survival it primes the the brain for survival it primes the heart for survival survival and then it allows our crews to show up, which you said, you know, luckily they were in service, hopefully they were really quick. They right? were very quick to get here. And I was I was really grateful for the 911 operator because even though you have the training and you think you know what you're gonna do, it was just really reassuring to know that they were right there and just like, okay, we're gonna count together and and do it. I, I think you you not only obviously were a huge contributor to Bree's survival and being able to, to live the life she has today, but I think you were a huge contributor just to the 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 overall scene wellness. The other family members, you know, what was going on, everybody else, you took over and said, okay, I'm the instant commander at this scene. I'm gonna take care of things. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's, it's pretty pretty cool. Um, pretty, pretty awesome what you did. And you know, that's one thing we try to tell everybody, right? You know, if I'm teaching a class, I'll be with you for maybe 30 minutes or an hour. Uh -huh. And we'll watch videos, we'll talk about numbers and rates and these things. And, and we no longer need to breathe for patients. We just do by standard hands only CPR. That's what helps. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't plan on most people remembering a word that I say. So we just say, hey, look, when in doubt, call 911 because our dispatchers are a fantastic tool. They know what to do, they'll coach you, they'll be your biggest encouragement, and you'll succeed because of them. Right, uh, and I was so, very grateful. Yeah, that's, that's really inspiring to hear. So grandma took care of the scene. She started everything off. And then as I spoke to you on the phone, Rochelle, it kind of sounds like you got here fairly quickly too, because yeah. obviously you went into mom mode, and uh, <laughs> and I'm sure you, you drove the speed limit, but I you did. But <laughs> kind of. I was texting and driving, but I wasn't speeding yet. <laughs> uh, and and you said you got to the scene, and the paramedics and EMTs were still here. Yep. And then that's kind of where I'll let you just take off. You know, what did you experience as a mom, and how did things go for you? So I was in Pasco, was teaching preschool, and I had like 10 minutes left in my class. And I got a call from my cousin. I think it was my cousin. She's like, Bree's seizing. Uh, they're call 911, like, get here. And so I just told, ran upstairs and told him, Bree's uh, seizing. Yeah. He kind of thought heat sleeping. exhaustion or okay. like, he was just trying to guess what happened. Like maybe she got too hot. And so I just drove from Pasco to here. And when I got here, they were just barely lifting her up onto the stretcher mm -hmm. or gurney. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, pulled in, was calm, just like walked right to the side of her. And I was like, hey, I'm the mom. And we just walked with them. And um, we got right to the ambulance and they got her in and they were like, secure the airway. Like, it just felt calm in my state because I was just there as her mom, just to advocate for her. Like, I'm here, tell me what to do. But I knew that I didn't have anything really to offer besides just be there for her. And so then the team was trying to get her all in the, the ambulance and securing her airway and one of the medics told me that this daughter needed me and I was torn because my second daughter needed comfort from having seen what she saw mm -hmm. and her perspective was Brie turned blue and grandma had to give her a kiss and I don't know what's going on and when's Brie <laughs> coming home and I'm just like mom and I was like I don't know what's going on either yeah. but right now Brie needs me yeah. and I just felt this peace to hug her and tell her I'll bring Brie home just go with grandma here's my keys I got in the ambulance with a wallet and a cell phone, <laughs> and that's it. And we went, and I just, the short, I mean, really just a Cadillac, short drive, got her in there. They were trying to get her all hooked up, but they couldn't get her oxygen above like 30%, I believe. They tried several times to get higher oxygen, and they just couldn't get her, especially on the ventilator. If they hand pumped her, they could get it go up, but when they switched her to the ventilator, like that's the pump that yeah. just does it yeah. automatically, yeah. it would just go to 30%. And they were just like, I don't, I, this is, I don't know what's why we can't get more air in her. And mm -hmm. it felt like there was a little bit of, like everyone was scrambling to like, what can we do next? You know, in a calm way. It wasn't crazy, but I was like, sure. didn't feel like we had an answer why she wasn't getting the air. Right. Um, but then he got right there to the ER pretty quick too. And um, 
I, I think something uh, about our conversation that that was very interesting to me is I remember you telling me I don't I, I can't really picture faces yes but I can remember forearms I do I remember <laughs> because, the forearms because from the guy because, because they were doing compression they right? were yep and so um, you know I, I think another point to make there is you know as responders you know obviously those of us who are on the ambulance that day or who are who are on you know the cruise we're in charge of patient care yeah. but then we also have a battalion chief that responds and, and oftentimes a chaplain that will respond yeah and we always try to encourage our folks that aren't necessarily you know maybe needed for patient care to remember that there's that mom there's the grandma there's the secondary patient that you know needs us kind of like your other yeah. daughter needed you right and so how can we better facilitate you know the care of not just the patient but then the family as well yeah and that's something that we're always trying to improve upon and, and focus on as well but um so you got to the hospital and it sounds like uh, Bree was flown out fairly quickly yep the same day right oh yeah it and was then like within an hour within, yeah. and then you guys had talked about her oxygen levels not being able to get uh, to 30 and you had mentioned to me on the phone that it was due to the the intubation tube yep. the et tube being kinked mm -hmm. of which was a very rare circumstance yeah. that one of the doctors said he'd really ever never was it never seen before? It was the respiratory specialist okay. from the air flight crew. Yeah. Okay. He so said they, he'd never seen it before. Yeah. So they actually, I think they <coughs> documented picture, that, yep. took a picture, and then sent that off to the company to say, hey, what, what happened, right? Right. And those are the things that in every circumstance, whether it's a recognition barrier or whether it's a patient care barrier, because every cardiac arrest is different. Yep. Where it occurs, the circumstances behind it, the, the patient uh, specificity, you know, what we need to do to overcome that cardiac arrest is always changing. And so, you know, when we think about building a resilient community, um, it's having conversations like this that really help us to build that resiliency throughout our community because, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, we took an American Heart Association class and it's it's yeah. very cinematic. It's a, it's a Hollywood production, you know, right? Um, whereas here, it's a real life circumstance. And, and one of which I, think, I don't think we'll ever stop talking about necessarily only because it's so inspiring. Um, and now you, you told me about Bree's personality, and, and Eddie, feel free to chime in any time, yeah, right? I, I feel yeah. I'm, I'm also husband, and I, I, I just kind of sit quietly too. Uh, any experience you have, feel free to, to give us that. Um, but it sounds like Bree has quite the personality, and you know, although the whole chance survival worked really well that day, yeah. I think Bree's a fighter, Definitely. <laughs> and I, I think that uh, she's a pretty spunky little girl. So. Yes. Um, What's Brie up to today? <clears throat> she's at school. Yeah, how old is she now? Ten. Ten years old. Yep, she's turned ten in January. So, so. this this occurred when she was eight? Seven. Seven? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. It was September. <clears throat> September 4th, yeah. 2020. So seven, seven years, years old. old, she's ten today. Yep. And how, how's she doing? So, she's doing great. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't know how far you want to go back. So when we were in Seattle, mm -hmm. she had to learn to do everything again. Okay. So once they discovered that the tube was kinked, they decided, well, they put in a new one and then her oxygen went up to 100%. Like okay. it just was perfect. And so we thought she was pretty stable for that weekend. And so he flew, came up right away. He just followed me. He was so good. Like go to the ER, he was at the ER. Go to Seattle, I flew, he drove. And like he was right there by my side too. And um, we thought, okay, she's pretty stable. Like things are going good. Like maybe you can go home and get close and actually think for a minute of what we need. Cause there was a lady in Cadillac who was like, okay, she's gonna want clean underwear. She's gonna want her stuffed animals. Like give us five things that she needs. Cause yeah. she says in these moments you don't think and you don't think about what you want or what you need. A cell phone charger, a wallet, stuff that is useful. But in the moment, literally I had my phone and my keys, just go. I don't have my keys, my wallet. And so having, I remember the medic telling me like, this girl needs you and then at the hospital saying okay this is what you need like just pack these things here's a list did she even oh, give you yeah. a paper yeah they gave me a list of everything that i should go pack so i went <laughs> home and i just got everything <laughs> the best i could i obviously forgot stuff because i had to go back but um but yeah that was kind of nice i think was it the nurse that handed me that i think so i think it was the nurse at at catholic yeah that day was really small for me because like I knew some of the medics on the scene and I knew, and we knew some of the ER doctors. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it, it was, it was, it just felt really small that day. Yeah. How, how many people we knew that were us, helping yeah. in this moment. Yeah. And, um, I was probably the least directly involved. Um, I, but, uh, but yeah, I just remember feeling like, wow, this is insane. I know a lot of these people and like we're being hand given everything we need to do. It was, 
was that yeah. that nurse that gave that list that was really that really helped out a lot because I don't think about it. <laughs> it was calming, and in the moment, the adrenaline's yeah. just kicking, and you're like, just go. I don't need anything. But then you're like, you Absol- have to eat. You ha- I remember them telling me, you need to eat. You need water. And I'm like, no, I'm fine. But like, no, you haven't eaten in how many hours or whatever, <laughs> and reminding you to take care of yourself. And it's hard enough that you to don't go, think about. <laughs> yeah, it's hard enough to go to the grocery store without a list, <laughs> let, alone, <laughs> let alone do this without a list, right? So, right. I mean, yeah, those patient care advocates, right, that yeah. aren't necessarily involved in patient care, but at the hospital, that's a lifesaver. Having yeah. a list to say, this is your next step, and this is what you need to be successful, that's fantastic. So how long were you guys in Seattle for? So total, I was there for two months. He uh-huh. came back and forth to help with our kids and family helped with kids and things. But um, after that weekend, we felt like she was stable and was probably safe to go home and get things we needed. Um, she actually had a second cardiac arrest and um, they had CPR. I think they had her back in about four minutes. It was pretty quick. I was standing there with the doctor. Happened right then, her pulse like flew to 140 and then dropped like 140, 30, I think. It was just crazy fast. And then she was no pulse. And they're like CPR everyone was in there it was super quick and then at that point they said we need to put her on life support because her mm-hmm. heart's just quivering mm-hmm. and we'll put her on a list for a heart transplant mm-hmm. and so I was like okay like let's go with it and so they, go ahead. they put her on it was called ECMO right it was like an ECMO, ECMO machine. yep yeah. and then even on the ECMO machine her because of the the way what was her condition again restrictive, restrictive cardiomyopathy, cardiomyopathy. It, I guess the muscles were so tense that the ECMO machine couldn't even flow through. So they had to take her, get, do a small surgery where they punched a hole oh, that's so that right. the ECMO blood mm-hmm. or, or it could flow. Yeah. And um, and then that after that surgery, that's when the surgeon sat down with us and, and they started t- telling us most likely what our options are. But um, yeah. how soon after being told she needed a transplant did she get the, the transplant? Oh, that was... Another miracle. Right. It was. It was absolutely. Seven days? It was 10 days from the day she got put on the list to the day we got the donor. But it was about 14 days from when they told us, you need a transplant, and this is all that it entails. But there was a... She needed to show brain activity, and because of her two cardiac arrests and her two strokes that happened with that, she wasn't moving, responding, opening her eyes. Like, she would delayed look at us, but she wouldn't talk, or she couldn't move her head or do anything. So we had about three or four days, maybe a week of just being with her, just like, Bree, come on, I'm your mom. Just smile. Just look at me. Just, I need to show them that you're in there because I know you're in there. (laughs) And she started laughing one morning and I was like, I asked her a question and she started laughing and I knew that she was laughing in response to that question. So we knew she was there and it would be a good candidate. So then the neurology team walked in and they saw her laughing and I asked her that same question and she laughed again and they're like, okay, like we can put her on the list. All right, here's so on. they put her on and then they bumped her up because of her severity. It was September 27th when she received her new heart and um, the recovery after that was just incredible. Um, I mean, it was, she had to learn everything from the beginning, but she did it so, so amazingly quick. and so quickly yeah. comparative to it was just amazing to yeah. watch. It was miracle after miracle. It was no question. It was, yeah. So if if you were to have any maybe advice or just maybe, you know, encouragement to other families that are in your circumstance, right? They have a child who unexpectedly went a cardiac arrest. What, what would that be? Um, I guess as a mom, mm-hmm. be calm. Like, trust in God. Let it be in his hands. And there's a lot of help. Like, yeah. the medics were amazing. Cadillac team was amazing, Seattle was amazing, the neurology team, the rehab team, like I just felt so blessed because I was so guided and it wasn't all like I'm the mom I have to know it all, I have to know what to do. They taught me and step by step like she relearned, I learned to give meds, I learned to track vitals, I learned to do a lot of things and um, so I mean even just that two months we were away from home from September 4th to November 4th when we actually came home, there was just a lot of peace that like trust the, the professionals around you it's in God's hands a lot of it I mean Bree's story is such a miracle you could line up so many things the timing of it that just like it was here the fire station's there it was like five minutes like the Cadillac the is right, right there, there yeah. the team we knew the ER doctor we knew not that it matters that we knew them but it was just kind of cool that people come together no matter where you've met them in school or college or whatever walks of life when there's an emergency they come together and 
they'll love your daughter, love your patient. And that's one thing I admired so much is the respiratory team on the air flight, they never gave up on Bree. They, he hand pumped her the 45 minute flight. He never stopped moving the stretcher. Like he never gave up on her. And I feel like that was a big blessing to her to save her life as well. And I've never met him before and he's never met Bree before, yeah. but he did it. And so, and I'd been told later that like, oh, when you showed up on the scene, you were calm. And I was like, it wasn't me. Like, <laughs> if it was mom out, I'd be like, what is going on? Where are my other kids? What is, you know, everything taken care of, but just like, it's gonna be okay. Yeah. And if it's not, it's in God's hands. Everyone's got to play in this, and it's gonna work out. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, throughout the nation, 70% on average, you know, is is the national uh, statistic. But here in Richland, it's been 68%. So pretty much right on par with the nation. Um, cardiac arrest happens at home. This didn't happen at home, but just like at home, you're dealing with a loved one, right? Yeah. Whether it's a young kiddo or a mom or dad or or whoever, mm -hmm. right? And so the unfortunate reality of, of cardiac arrest is that. A lot of us experience it, and it's typically a loved one who's going to have to mitigate the initial stage of that. And so, uh, yeah, you're right. The more exposure they have to CPR training, to the recognition barriers, to the emotional barriers, to be able to, you know, in our classes, they get to listen to 911 audio of callers reporting people in cardiac arrest. And so, um, I think the more we can expose people to the reality of what it is, and then at the same time, inspirational stories like this to say, hey, you doing this today really truly does make a difference, right? Yeah, it does. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I want to bring up is because you guys have attended now two chain of survival ceremonies. It, you know, part of the process to become a heart safe community um, is to have these ceremonies. So talk just maybe a little bit about your experience at these ceremonies and maybe some of um, the things that unexpectedly came out of attending and how that's maybe um, you know, I guess been an experience for you. Yeah. So I think we were super excited. Bree's just, she's so happy. Like anything that's about her, I mean, she loves life anyways, but like, Bree, there's going to be a ceremony about you that you survived and you're going to meet the guys that saved you that day. Like you're heroes. Like she was so excited. And so going up there to be able to shake their hand and exchange a coin and like see that relationship build a little bit that like, thank you for saving my life. And you know, without saying anything and for even her to walk through that line was really cool to see. And also it was awesome to see so many people attend that I wasn't the only mother who had a child go through this. It wasn't my, you know, there was other people having cardiac arrest and all different stories, but there was something we all connected. We all had, you know, a loved one have to see this or go through this. Mm -hmm. And so there was that connection there. And then I think the second year when we came back, Brie kind of just felt like the top dog. Like I've done this before. <laughs> these are my people. I know these guys, they're all my friends now, or they come to my run or, you know, she just felt more confident and proud to yeah. be a survivor. And this year they asked us if we wanted to speak. And I was thinking as the mom, what should I say? Like, what do I say? And I took her, she wanted to speak. I took her up there and she just said, thanks for saving my life and sat down <laughs> but it was like short and sweet and I was like what more could you want from a little girl for not giving up for not you know yeah. for those forearms being there and yeah not giving up and when you're talking about CPR in the hospital they had me train again before I could leave and even just putting my hands on a mannequin and counting and doing it with Bree in the room thinking like this could be Bree's body I could be doing this again and having that confidence that like they did Baby Shark or a certain song. Just sing a song yeah. and just do it. Don't think about how much you're counting or how hard or like just do it. It will help. And um, so, yeah, we love the chain of survival. And there's always donuts and treats, which they're like, oh, sugar. Yeah, yeah. Promoting heart health with donuts. We haven't we haven't quite nailed that yet. Um, but but it they gets like you, it. But it gets, it gets you all there, right? So the crumble it's, cookies and spread that donuts. Brie will be there forever. They had fruit too, and yeah. she does love fruit. Well, excellent. Um, I'll just end by saying, you know, just for you being able to come out here and talk about this stuff and. And, and have the mindset of, it's really, we, we get to sit here and celebrate something awesome, right? We're not mourning something, we get to celebrate something that is unfortunate, but at the same time, with Bree's personality and with uh, the strong family unit that you are, um, it's just such a successful story. And it's inspiring, it's, it's awesome. Uh, too many awesome words I could say about it, but um, <laughs> you're courageous for doing it. And uh, the resiliency in your family is what we hope for our community, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.